Who buy it? Uh, what? Greetings, strange traveler. Would you like to join a guild? What? No! I. I was in my house! Would you like to see what some of these guilds talking about? I was in my house, man! Mashoko Tensei is the best isekai ever created. Point blank. Period poo. And when I say period poo, I'm not talking about like city girls. Period poo. No, it smells like period poo. It smells like when you're menstruating and then you take a dump in the toilet. That's what it smelled like. Period poo. Tonight I'm gonna have myself a real good time. I feel alive. This should not be new news. I'm pretty sure I'm on record saying many times that I am not the biggest fan of the isekai subgenre. Specifically because of what it has normalized into. And every time anyone tells me otherwise, I just want to fucking scream. I'm all for the idea that any and everybody should be able to tell whatever kind of story that they want. And dedicating an entire genre to that is a beautiful thing. Until it's gone gone too far <laughs> please stop please stop please stop please stop okay what do we got all right let's do this one last time a story about the literal devil himself getting a job at mcdonald's uh, sh sure go nuts that one time i did the reincarnation thing with some slime yeah sure whatever the magical revolution of the reincarnated princess and the genius young lady okay Kinda of pushing it, dial it back a little bit. Reborn as a vending machine, as I now wandered. Who the fuck? My first thought when I saw this show was, "What the hell is this plot?" Because dead ass, what could this show possibly be about? Honestly and truly, what could a show about a dude who likes vending machines dying and becoming a vending machine possibly have to say about anything? Oh no! If I don't do something, that vending machine's in trouble! Uh. Combination. What story do you need to tell so bad? You just had to write this light now, Hirokuma. What the fuck was it? What was the inspo? Did you lose a bet? I know vending machines in Japan are pretty cool, and I shouldn't be taking this show's existence this seriously, but with this title alone, you can see why the isekai genre absolutely fucking disgusts me. Now I don't want to be known as that dude to pretentiously push out propaganda that all isekai is shit. You can take that to Twitter, I don't really care that much. I'm just a guy who loves anime and writes stories. I like to analyze stories. I like to analyze characters. I like to see, tell, and experience every kind of story imaginable that honestly any screenplay writer or author can come up with. So to understand my love for Mashoko Tensei, you must first understand how a majority of these dumbass fantasy stories are the bane of my creative little soul. <laughs> こんな気持ちになったのは初めてです。好きだ。俺と一緒に幸せ。マクママコさん。危ない。Because you wanna know why? You wanna know how I got these scars? It's because most isekais don't give a single shit 
about storytelling because the story is already set once the author comes up with his brain dead idea for a premise a premise that at least a thousand other people have shitted out before in some different variation you don't want to be like this this is disgusting this is awful in every way so i will say it again i love stories i love dramatic stories i love superhero stories romantic stories sci-fi stories coming of age stories based off real life stories and yes i do love fantasy stories <laughs> take a shot every time he says story you think it's so fucking funny huh uh, funny funny so let me make this very clear to all the isekai fans out there. Isekais don't care about telling stories. Isekais care about meeting a requirement of checklist. A checklist of tropes. Tropes. Trope number one. Death by bus <laughs> A meme that's been around since before I had chest hair. Surprise, surprise, I don't find it very funny. I don't like him, he just don't like him, give it a shot. It was tolerable the first 10 times, but now on take a thousand, I need someone to give a better reason for the main character finding himself in this fantasy world. <laughs> hey, I don't know. Maybe something like a magical wardrobe to another world in your house. Maybe if you look through a camera lens, the protagonist sees he's been in a fantasy world all along. Or just have him start off already in the fantasy world. Fuck. Japan's obsession with reincarnation is so tiring. truck is no longer a funny little meme. It is now a defect. A glitch in the system. An anomaly that needs to be dealt with at the source and exterminated. Trope number two. The male lead has a hero. <laughs> Any isekai story that has this trope automatically gives off basement dweller vibes. Gives off horny teenager in my room drawing my OC on a throne with all the girls in my class wanting to ride the dreamer. It feels like a glorification for incels to explore their bad habits of not needing to work for a sexual partner since he can just self insert himself into a story where all the girls are on his dick already. Or you know. Just buy a slave to smash. Yeah, these are definitely healthy stuff we should normalize. Or the worst trope imaginable, where they form a harem and then they just don't have sex at all because that's so realistic. Like, I know that's what you want to do. Just do it. Trope number three, the overpowered main lead. This is a personal one because for me, One Punch Man has done the... I can be everybody and I really never have any worries about losing a fight thing so well for me that anybody else in the industry that tries to do it without the pieces that make One Punch Man work so well just fall flat honestly. And Isekai is just like every anime trope known to man love to use this one. This is their favorite. The dude from Isekai Cheat Magician. The dude from The Fruit of Revolution. Toya from Another World with my smartphone. <sighs> the Saga of Tanya the Evil. Makoto from Moonlit Fantasy. Merlin from Wise Man's Grandchild. The dude from Log Horizon. That one guy from No Game No Life. Fucking Overlord. Mandaji from Problem Children are coming from another world, aren't what? Oh my god. Okay, scratch this list. Number three instead will be I hate these stupid ass titles and easy guys. A boy who has been reincarnated twice spends peacefully as an S rank adventurer. Yes, it's absolutely red like that. He could even make the title coherent. Whoever made that really needs some grammarly. After being transported, comma, I was singled out and rejected by my classmates. So I made them all part of like motherfucker, these are just sentences. You're not making titles. You're just writing bullshit. Now here are just a few more tropes so you can get the idea of what I'm talking about because if I keep going into detail, we'll be here all day. Number four, God giving the main character powers and then never explaining why. Copy and paste fantasy races in every isekai. A logical character progression. Basically the normal dude who becomes dragon slaying hero man within a couple of episodes. Fight scenes without stakes. The protagonist is way too overpowered to be in any danger. If it's a story about people getting isekai in the world all at the same time, why the fuck is everybody Japanese? This is just a few of the reasons why I don't like isekais. But you know what? 
I love me some Mashoko Tensei. Yeah. And the funniest thing about what I just ranted about is that Mashoko Tensei has damn near all of these tropes. All of them. But the difference between Mashoko Tensei and what it does with its tropes versus the generic isekai schlock is that Mashoko Tensei released its light novel in 2012 and basically normalized these tropes you see in isekai today. If you like Shield Hero, well hey, you like Mashoko Tensei. If you like ReZero, yep. You like Mashoko Tensei. But Mashoko Tensei isn't just the best isekai ever made in my eyes because it grandfathered a bunch of tropes. Yeah, that. It's the greatest isekai ever for me because of the maturity it displays with these tropes. This is the offer of Mashoko Tensei. And yeah, if you haven't noticed, I think that jobless reincarnation sounds dumb and I'm never gonna use that name ever. Refugion is a writer I've come to respect just through this one story, I'm in love with terrible, disgusting, flawed characters either seeing the light, learning a lesson through others' actions or on their own. And Mashoko Tensei blessed us with one of the most flawed characters to ever be written. Oh man. Oh man. Because Jesus Christ does he feel way too real. Mishoko Tensei is the story of a Discord moderator basically learning to be a normal person. Unlike Oshinoko where I feel like the reincarnation trope doesn't really need to be a thing within that story, Mishoko Tensei is elevated by the fact that we know that behind Rudy's emerald green eyes is a disappointment of a man in every way. We are always inside Rudy's head wanting him to do the right thing, make the right decision, be a better person person. Wow. Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. <laughs> Let's play a little trick. I guess that ring works after all. So as the story progresses and his flaws start to show less, you really get the chance to see the type of person that Rudy would have been before he got isekai and could have been a proper member of society. Rudy is a smart, rational, intellectually competent, as well as impulsive and just downright intolerant, so he feels grounded and he doesn't feel like the self-insert perfect isekai man that you've come to know in most shows. Every time we hear Rudy speak, they remind us either through some down bad action or horny ass internal dialogue that there is a 30 year old man behind this child. Now that you mention it, I am kind of lonely. But I might try something dirty if you stay here. Fine then, you can do that. Just a little though. <laughs> Well, how can I refuse that offer? Nope, 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 stop talking, go to jail. Oh! Wait, hold up. Do we even know Rudy's original name? The fuck? My season one experience of Mashoko Tensei was an amazing one. I was truly jaw dropped by the levels of quality that the studio went through to make this show look as good as it looked. And it's crazy because season one wasn't really on my radar at all. I kind of found the series out of pure luck. And I loved it so much that I spun the block on it and watched it again last year. It is truly up there with some of my favorite fantasy world stories ever created, where the world building is basically a character in itself. You see? I don't need big titty harems with cat girls and elf milfs in a main character that the author clearly didn't give a shit enough about to write an actual personality for. Because you know. He just wants me to self-insert. Give me a fantasy story akin to Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, the pinnacle of what the word fantasy actually means. 2023 modern isekais are now TV shows trying to tell a story that are just thirst traps. Modern isekais put the average anime watcher back another year in terms of worldwide perception of weebs. But not in Mashoko Tensei, mm -mm. Any character from this cast has a mountain of things 
that make them relatable based off their stereotypical trope. It's sort of like the fantasy version of sex education in my mind. Roxy isn't just a cute lolly sensei here to develop the main protagonist's abilities and awaken a new fetish. She's an actual girl within the world with a family, traveling, making a living along with her own fears and insecurities about herself. The reason Rudy admires her so much isn't just cause he's still a perverted weirdo with a lot of problems he still had to get through. Roxy was the person who helped Rudy get over his fear of leaving his bubble because of the trauma he has from being so cartoonishly bullied in the real world. Hey look, I've seen the glory. Is this how y'all really get down in East Asia? Because this is just some evil shit. Even a character like Eris is more than just her T-word archetype. Yeah, we don't use that word over here. It's a stupid trope that has now warped the minds of every anime viewer based on how they see characters who are like Eris. Everything's fine, okay? I'm here for you. I'm sorry, Rudius. I'm not very good at this sort of thing. It's okay. You're doing great. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, it's kinda funny to call people Sundari's IRL, but when it comes to talking about anime, that word just holds no weight in the conversation for me anymore. Even Rudius's family surprised me on how much they matter to the story. Shit, I'd say the entire season is basically one big journey to find Rudy's family after the first turning point event. Paul isn't just some irresponsible, confident, goofy adventurer that sleeps with his maids while getting his wife prego at the same time. Halfway through the season, and bro honestly turns into one of my favorite characters of the show showing off how Rudy is still taking things within this world like this is still a MMO RPG and motherfuckers aren't actually stressed and dying over here bro just got teleported into a demon country and never asked himself once he got to safety hmm I wonder if the same thing happened to my family Paul and Rudy's reunion episode is probably my favorite of the entire show. If episode 5 is where Rudy copes with the fact that kitty cat Dwayne Johnson just sliced a man's head off in front of him, episode 17 for me is when he starts taking actions like a proper adult. Hey father, I have an idea. What? It may be a challenge, but I think we should try to act like grown-ups. I don't see what you're getting at. I'm pretty sure he's 30 this year. Still younger than I was when I died, and yet, I never took this kind of initiative. I just focused on blaming others. Compared to me, Paul's doing great. And there's so many characters that you can talk about, major and minor. But yeah, blah blah blah, Mashoko Tente is an amazing anime story and just all around good TV show. It's not like the best thing to show someone who's never seen an anime before. I personally feel that you need a couple notches under your belt to tolerate Rudy's degeneracy. So I'm giving Mashoko Tensei Season 1 an 8.5 out of 10. So with that, let's unpack Season 2 of Mashoko Tensei. Because I have some things to say about this season. But first things first, let me just say that Season 1 set such a high bar for me that season 2 really automatically couldn't be better. Season 1 feels like a complete adventure and journey along with a somber conclusion that leaves the door open for more story. And if it's true that we are getting a second core to this season and it's gonna be like around like 23 to 24 episodes just like season 1, then let me just say, I hope they pick it up in the second half. While season 2 is primarily about a school arc. Yay! I don't know y'all, this first half of season 2 from Mashoko Tensei was a weird experience for me. Because for the first half of it really, like the first couple episodes, I was honestly enjoying it. This season is primarily about three things really. Rudeus and Sophie's rekindling of their relationship, and no I'm not calling her Fitz. I will address her with the beautiful elf name she was born with. And it's also about learning more about the turning point events, as well as solving a couple of the end world mysteries everyone's been fiending to know. Oh yeah, and this season is also about how Rudy can't get his PPR. Whee! Now let me say this, it's almost been a year since I've watched anything isekai early. So once I booted up episode 1 and was hit with these landscape shots along with the amazing soundtrack, I'm pretty sure this anime is the first show I've seen that never 
never had an opening which is weird because this season they decided to make an opening and i'm just like Ugh, go back it kind of felt more immersive to get into this world for me that the title card sequence was literally just landscape shot paired up alongside the score i didn't really need generic anime opening fighting against nothing for this show you guys are better than that i love that mashoko tensei isn't about some big grand adventure to fight the demon lord or nothing stereotypical like that it's like yeah there's enemies apocalyptic events but rudius is never consciously searching for the conflict in his story i am the demon king buddy Gotti, and i've come to challenge you to a duel what is happening Mashoko Tensei is all about a man getting a second chance on life, trying to live it better. Except in this story, he gets to be a level 100 wizard. I appreciate how the show starts you off reminding you that, hey, you remember Sophie? Yeah, well, this entire season is gonna be about her. Get ready. I hope you just don't skip to episode one. You're gonna miss a lot of plot. Immediately, we're shown what happened to her during the first turning point. And can we talk about how crazy it is that if you're basically not a magic user, you're there is no saving you every single farmer in that region got clapped since apparently the teleportation event makes you airdrop from the sky like it's fortnite the opening episode was pretty solid to get me immersed back into this world but specifically back with a character we haven't seen since episode four of season one my biggest gripe about that is that sylphie just adopts an entirely new life instead of wondering where her family was because i feel like that's something she should have you know cared about because last time i checked she did have a family and it didn't seem like they treated her bad or anything but shit it's hard for me to remember last time i've seen her was episode four like this season we got to learn a lot about sylphie post time skip since we were first introduced to her as a child really but now we take a majority of the season to get to know more of her personality apparently she's very studious an absolute nervous anxious wreck and kind of a freak Sylphie, you said the other day that you want to be with Rudius, but I want to know what that means to you specifically. We would share a bed, and he can be crude sometimes, so he might say something like, I want to put a baby in you. Oh, Rudy, I'll take as many as you want to give me, and then we'll go to our room, and we'll kiss and start undressing each other. Then, I'll laugh too and say something like, well, we better get started then. You know, something like that. <laughs> <clears throat> Hell yeah, I'm horny. As in, horny. And I really like the scene of her being overwhelmed being around so many people since because she's lived in the countryside, she's never really had to listen to this much chatter all at the same time. That was a good little character moment for her. Thus confirming that once again that super hearing is such a shit superpower. Unless you're eventually able to control it or whatever, which I guess happened to Sylphie because this never happened again. Also, I completely forgot just how much sex and debauchery was in this show but to be fair i totally imagined this much fucking going on in this fantasy setting there is zero authority and everyone is just so aggressively horny all the time it's kind of insane the cinematography and fluidity of the animation somehow feels like a big step up from season one but other times it kind of looks so so and the animators like took a day off and they got the janitor to do some keyframes for them like remember the bread scene from season one putting this much detail into bread i bet you some poor animator didn't see his family for a whole month just to animate that single piece of bread the show also has some really nice film grain for both seasons but other than that you know it's still business as usual for mishoko tensei it's one of the best looking shows on air right now but it never really got to show it off this much that season because it was a less emphasis on action this season and that sometimes for me during like the latter half of the season it kind of felt like it was dragging and its feet a little bit but I, 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 i'll get on to that later because we're finally back with rudius now he's a little older now and very very depressed they ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine but you just can't get into it because they would never understand it's like come on bro how good was eris's coochie she messed up this man's sex life for a whole three years i find it kind of funny how rudy finally getting some punani is the reason he's so messed up right now to the point where he finally gets to move on from his abandonment issues move on from eris and at that point we're introduced to the real villain of this season, erectile dysfunction. 
No, I'm not joking. Rudy's development has never been a straight line. This motherfucker's arcs are the bumpiest shit imaginable. I mean, I'm still waiting for him to get over his sticky banded panty phase. Like, it's it's the reason people still hate this show because of this weird character quirk. I don't like that. We don't like that. Rudy is, after all these years, despite the trials and tribulations, will always regress to his bad habits because they make him comfortable, even as disgusting as they are. For half the season, Rudius's mental health stat point goes down like negative five every day. So how are we feeling about the run today, boys? Tindalos? Baskerville? <laughs> oh, is that so? <laughs> yeah, good job, boys. <laughs> he gets on a little self-improvement tick. He's on his Dorfin farm mark, doing community service, getting swole. I mean, it's not the worst thing to do to try and cure post-pussy depression. Now, I expected the little guild that Rudy joined to to be basically meaningless fodder, but instead, we meet Sarah. And this part of the story really resonated with me simply because when her and Rudy talked, they actually talked like two teenagers who don't know how to navigate relationships really. And it feels very real and genuine because most of us understand this feeling where you get to know somebody, you come to like them, and then you fuck it all up because of a stupid misunderstanding. What do I care if it doesn't work out? You really think I'd want a woman like her? I mean, she's built like a kid. A real woman ought to be like Elise, you know? Like, stacked, you get me? <laughs> uh... <sighs> no, Sarah, I... I didn't... <laughs> You're the worst. I never want to see your face again. Or how the show likes to display how beautiful, yet scary and uncomfortable sex with a new partner can be. Like I said, this show is honestly very mature, considering the main story of this season is about erectile dysfunction. It's pretty cathartic seeing Rudy let out all his true feelings on this guy in a bar. It's one of my favorite scenes of the season. It's him just beating up this dude who doesn't even hit him back and can tell that he's having a shitty day. I don't want anyone to hate me! That's why I'm always smiling like that! WHAT ABOUT THAT PISSES YOU OFF SO MUCH?! I just want you to stay. <clears throat> so bring it on. Take me, damn it. Have your fucking fun. And instead of fighting him, he buys him a beer and makes him talk about his feelings. He's like, that's so good. This is why I love this show. I'm not gonna lie, I wouldn't be surprised if Rudy doesn't accept Eris back right away into his life. Straight up dipping on him after taking each other's virginity really messed this man up beyond what I honestly expected. Eris clapped Rudy into the erectile dysfunction storyline in a fantasy adventure anime. How did we get here? I honestly don't know. But I love it. Real human drama amongst fantasy world bullshit is my secret kink. That's peak isekai to me. But yeah, basically Rudy has a long way to go. He's forming a better understanding of women still. But this is also a season where he almost kills himself. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So yeah, we still have a long way to go. <laughs> This honestly was the saddest part of the season so far. As polarizing of a character that Rudius is, you don't really want to see him like this. It's like bro needs some better help therapy or something. Which ironically, is the sponsor of today's- Nah, I'm just playing, but could you imagine? I mean, do any of us really know what we do if our first love and first ever sex partner just deletes themselves from our lives without a clear explanation? I'm not gonna lie, my lover boy ass would be just as distraught as Rudius. I'd be in fucking shambles. I'd be posting sad boy AMVs on TikTok about how women aren't shit and deserve less. Maybe some Bart Simpson Snapchat pictures. Someone would have to save me for real. Anyway, you guys want to see Rudy use his magic staff as a sniper? He got it! I got that thing on me. I got that stick. I got that too. I'm packing. I'm not gonna lie, that was pretty hard. Now once we enter the school arc, the story sort of 
takes a tonal turn. It sort of just becomes a slice of life fantasy show at this point. And at first, I was all for it. Bro got the Hogwarts invitation in the mail, and I was like, oh yeah, let's go. But I actually really like that Rudy turned the invitation down at first. And it shows me now that he learned to put his family first before his own personal desires, showing some real emotional maturity. She actually made me proud. And the reason he tells himself he needs to go is because he's plateaued in magic, but I'm like, what? No, you have it. And it's true that my magic's kind of plateaued, so I am interested. Cap. <laughs> <laughs> the literal first scene of the episode is Bro doing some level 1000 magic effortlessly. I have not seen Bro struggle once this season, but I don't know, maybe he forgot. I was initially happy going into this school arc, I'm not even gonna lie. But I'm gonna be real, out of all the arcs inside this show, the storylines, the Magic University storyline is honestly my least favorite part of this story so far. It's like, yeah, we get characterization for a lot of people, the sexy horny elf lady, Sylphie, the weird guy with the glasses, Akuma, that's all cool and all, but Jesus Christ, with six episodes of Sylphie hiding her identity from Rudy really necessary and what makes it even worse is that she spent six months with the man rekindling their friendship getting to know him again and I never understood the reason it's like yeah the first time he met you he thought you were a dude but like come the fuck on she's out here wearing sunglasses at night what are we doing? As soon as Rudy gets to the school, she's like, Oh, Rudy, I missed you. But oh, I can't get too close. I have a duty to protect the princess now. And the princess is like, I don't care. Do what you want. And she still doesn't tell him. Sylphie, you turn to stare at Rudius every time he goes past, you realize. Should I not? You can. There's nothing wrong with it per se. But it's sad. You feel so strongly for him, and yet he's forgotten you completely, hasn't he? Well, I don't know. He may remember. I still haven't told him my name or anything yet. <laughs> Are you fucking dumb? She's out here blowing her cover with zero excuses to cover stuff up. Hey Fitz, why do you wear shades, like, all the time? Yes, but I can't tell you why, sadly. Apologies. It's okay. Hey Fitz, why do you always start conversations with me when you're supposed to never talk? I've noticed that you talk to me pretty normally. Oh? What do you mean? You seem to be known as a man of few words. Uh, yes. In truth, I'm awfully shy. Like, oh, brother. I can't deal with that. I hate storylines like this. This whole hidden identity shit got old so fast, it was insane. Because we all know he's gonna eventually find out. If she keeps on insisting that they keep on hanging out, asking him on dates and stuff, what's her plan here? For half the season, she has Rudy contemplating whether or not he's attracted to men or not. His smile definitely makes my heart skip a beat or two. I was sure I didn't swing that way. I think I'm gay. She has this man questioning his own sexuality for no reason other than the fact that she was scared. This was infuriating for me. Would you not think that he would want to know that his first friend ever is alive and well? I'm pretty sure for like six months she hit my man with the Clark Kent disguise and got away with it that entire time. Just for him to inevitably find out. Oh, shocker. And know it was her once she revealed herself. Master Fitz, I have a question. What is it? Ask away. Is your name... I mean, is your real name... Sylphiette, by any chance? Yes, it is. Oh, for real? On God? <laughs> Just like that. It's not the worst thing ever by far, but it's just eye rolling for me. Since it's the crutch of the season, and I do really actually like these two together. And it sucks, cause this season has one of the biggest plot twists of the show that just came out of nowhere early. But I wasn't even thinking about it because I was just mad at how indecisive Sylphie was. I really like that Rudy's depression at the end of season one carried over into this season, cultivating into an entire erectile dysfunction plot line, ending with him falling in love with Sylphie again just to get through it. I just don't think that tying it in with this 
contrivity of a storyline was so necessary for me. Him falling in love with Sophie should have been way more heartfelt for me, but it just wasn't that much, and that's really disappointing for me. Even the princess is like, yo, okay. I know I said I'd let you tell Rudy on your own, but come on now. Get the fuck on with it. We got like two episodes left. As of right now, season two of Mashoko Sensei is getting a clean 6.5 out of 10 for me, and I imagine it's gonna pick up for the second half, because in all honesty, this season of Mashoko Tente was honestly pretty underwhelming for me. I loved the first five episodes, but the slice of life school stuff was not as engaging as I thought it'd be. And it's crazy, because I was a dead ass excited for it too. The best part of this school arc besides episode 10 was when Rudy just went to buy a slave, and I can't stand this happy ass music while he was doing it, it was pretty jarring. Sir, sir! <laughs> I'll take two of those to go. Rudy is coming from modern society was a little bit too comfortable inside this setting as in buying a slave he was a little bit too comfy for my liking but you could kind of tell that he was still a little uncomfortable doing it. I get why people online are upset about this but in a world where there's human gorillas and cat people I'm not too surprised that the emancipation proclamation wasn't issued. Like shut the fuck up it's just a stupid isekai. Was there any controversy in Harry Potter about the enslavement of goblins? I think goblin lives matter too. But but yeah, Michelle Kotense is still amazing, y'all. And I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. I really think the second half of season two is gonna pick up. Rudy is still the best part of the show, and somehow the worst part of the show at the same time, for a lot of people, I imagine. He truly feels like a real person plopped in the isekai world, completely morally gray, and in most instances, sometimes he'll only help people if it benefits him. He can be selfish, a disgusting weirdo, pervert, and just downright insufferable. But to be honest, it's kinda why you can't wait to see the person he'll become into, and the reason you keep watching. He isn't a cool fantasy hero, here to get all the hoes, slay some monsters, and look hard while doing it. He's just some random ass dude, who got shitted out into another world, and is now trying to take care of what he cares about. If I didn't find the character so interesting, and this world honestly so intriguing, I would've never notice how little we really advanced the overall plot of the show for the first half of this season. And to be honest, that's okay. Because they did other stuff that mattered, I think. I think the moral of the story so far is that I guess even anime characters need mental health breaks. Oh, brother! Did you tell me this was over? over. There ain't no use talking you do. Tell me it was over